Oh, thank you very much, Billy. That's really, that was very lovely. Thank you. Um, well, good morning. Yes, my name is Steph. And Billy just gave such a, I'm not sure I have a comprehensive <laughs> knowledge of feminist theory. I'm not sure I wrote that. Anyhow. Oh, good. <laughs> well, radio, thank you. Um, Okay, so is this better? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for being here and taking an interest in women's sex-based rights. It's been really lovely to meet new people and see some lovely familiar faces. Um, as Millie said, I am co-founder of Fair Go for Queensland Women and we um, started a, a Facebook page after just myself and a friend from primary school just got sick of just yabbering on at one another about the issue and it um, not being really talked about in Australia and Queensland. Um, I was aware of course of IWD Brisbane Mianjin, now Mianjin Brisbane, um, but it began from there. Um, I would just also like to acknowledge the, trad the traditional owners of the land that we meet upon today and the elders past, present and emerging. Um, as Millie mentioned, some of you may be familiar with this ongoing project that I commenced some years ago, collecting data from the Queensland Corrective Services in relation to prison population in Queensland, with a view to looking into how sex and gender identity are recorded, and how the offending patterns of individuals across sex and gender identity interact and how they present. Um, I'm pleased to report that we do, we have now 11 years worth of data from 2013 to 23, um, collected, oh. um, the data points are from the 30th of June for each year um, and recorded by the most serious charge or conviction. So that means that someone with a murder charge or conviction could rep be represented by other lower, like murder is the most serious charge, obviously. So they could be represented in other data points, but they're not recorded. Um, another caveat is that it appears that males who have, and females, I presume, who have had their birth certificates altered via previous births, deaths and marriages legislation are recorded in the sex that they've acquired legally rather than the actual sex that they are and were born with. So that confounds, in particular, the female data set for Queensland. So I guess I would like to just assert the following couple of points before I move on to talking about Dejaney. Dejeuner, sorry. Sex is a relevant factor for consideration in policy and safeguarding endeavours. It's enduring in relation to who commits crime, particularly violent and sexual crime. And this is enduring across time and location. And I think someone mentioned that yesterday. Um, I submit that the evidence we have gathered indicates there's very real and important questions to be asked about males who say they are transgender their rates of offending and the type of offending that they participate in. So in keeping with the findings of Dejaney, which found that in this study, male to female individuals had a higher risk for criminal conviction compared to female controls, but not to male controls. So that means that the male pattern offending persists and these individuals in this study were post-surgery. So this is not even related to self-identification and it relates to a data set of individuals who um, I think engaged in counselling and assessment prior to surgery. So it's very different to the cohort of individuals assumed under the umbrella of self-identification. So, the information from 2013 to 23 finds that males who say they are transgender in Queensland commit offences in a similar rate to other, other males, and that females who say they are transgender 
similarly appear to offend or be charged at rates similar to other women. So this is just the basics of the total population of males and females in the Queensland prison estates, and it's um, indicated by the sex of the individuals. So you can see that even when it was lower, back in 2013, women were about 10% of the male population. And that's consistent in terms of, like when you look at this last year, it's still kind of 90-10. This is the individuals who identify as transgender in the Queensland prison population, and that's by sex of the prison. So as I said earlier, the earlier caveat, I am not sure how many males were placed in the female prison estate by virtue of change of birth certificates because of the last birth, deaths and marriages legislation that allowed for that to occur post-surgery. So as you can see, um, males are in prison, males who say they are transgender are in prison or were in prison on the 30th of June of each year at a far greater rate than females who said they were transgender. Um, So when we look at sex offending within the population of males who say they're transgender, there are clear issues that need further investigation and consideration across policy areas. In the 2021 census data for England and Wales found that there were 48,000 males who said they were transgender in England and Wales. There were some difficulties around the terminology used in that census, but that was what was found, 48,000. When the figure was used to look at how likely each group in the community was in prison for sexual offences, the results were shocking. So that is um, in text, but this is a visual representation of the number of individuals per... So it's the top one is three per million incarcerated sex offenders of women. 395 million per million, sorry. 395 men per million in the population were um, in prison in England and Wales as sex offenders. And men who identified as transgender, 100 and, well, sorry, 1916 per million. So that is far greater than the female population I would just like to submit. Um, does anyone want me to explain a little bit about how they came to that, or does that make sense? They just use the, the figures just from the census? They use the figures from the census and the Ministry of Justice data regarding sex offending for the same year. So when I saw this, I thought, I have similar data. Why don't I look at Queensland? And so it was about 0.1%, I think. And so I ran the numbers for Queensland using our census data for the same year. And I found that there were one in 2,444 males in prison for aggravated sexual assault. That's the terminology used in Queensland. One in 1,600 oh, numbers. <laughs> I, yeah, sorry, I can't talk. 167,998 females in prison for the same. One in 206 males who identify as transgender. So not only is it a far higher rate than males in the general population, it's massively different to females in the population. And I think, um, Further to that, it's, this issue is also demonstrated by the fact that for the data set that I've um, received via right to information to QCS, Queensland Corrective Services, this year, the number of males on the 30th of June held for charge or conviction for aggravated sexual assault, that is males who identify as transgender, 
equaled the number of women held on the same charge for the same date. So there were 15 out of 65 males held in prison on aggravated sexual assault charges, males who identify as transgender, there were 15 women on the same charge of conviction. So 15 out of this tiny population, 15 out of half of Queensland. I submit that means that we have a lot of investigation to do before we say absolutely we should raise some males above basic safeguarding purely because they self-identify as transgender. So similar disparities are found when we look at sexual and violent offending, comparing the differing groups. So someone in the UK recently did this and found that I think it was 75% of males who identify as transgender were in prison for violent or sexual offending. I gathered the numbers in relation to murder, attempted murder, aggravated sexual assault, child exploitation material charges, and aggravated robbery, I think, a couple others that, you know, represent violent and sexual offending. And I found that males who identify as transgender, they're the, out of the 65 that were held in the male prison this year, 55% of those were held on violent or sexual charges or convictions. Males, out of the 9,700 and something, 45% were held on those same violent or sexual charges or convictions, and of the women, 35%. So you can see that, stepping down, females remain far less violent and prone to sexual offending than males. We also, you know, when you take into account the small number of females in prison, charged or convicted, compared to like 975, I think, compared to 9,182 males, the disparity between male and female offending is clear. Joe Phoenix has pointed out in a, oh, some wag said this, I just thought it was funny, in the um, wake of the BBC and other um, outlets repeatedly referring to a alleged and then convicted murderer and cat torturer as a woman throughout their reporting across over a year and then it coming out that it's actually a male who identifies as transgender and women saying these are not our crimes please stop reporting it as if they are women's crimes it is not fair to women it presents a discriminatory view of women and it misrepresents women so this person said, oh, but what about these ones? That's it. That's all. And they had to go across a couple of centuries and a few continents to get six. <laughs> so, Joe Phoenix has pointed out in this paper that was released in February last year that there are significant knowledge gaps, as I alluded to earlier, that need to be addressed in relation to the push to place males in the female prison estate. These gaps include, but are not limited, to what security risks are introduced to female prisons when males are in added, what risks do females who identify as transgender pose, particularly if they are taking testosterone, which may have an impact upon their behaviour. What impact will the introduction of males have upon rehabilitation programs, security of the prison system, where women's prisons are generally, they have far less need for high security measures because attempts to escape and property damage are far fewer. What are the impacts upon staff? Um, in Queensland, police and corrective services have policy that suggests that males who identify as transgender can request a female to search them. And also, as was raised in the UK recently in relation, in relation to prison po policing, what impacts are there for transge of transgender staff 
seeking to search members prisoners of the opposite sex. I would add to this that the robust collection of data regarding those who identify as transgender in the wider population is essential so that we can see exactly what we are dealing with. And I think that's important for everybody, including the transgender community. These efforts are, however, hampered by groups who say they are for transgender rights. They seek to conflate sex and gender, making it very, very difficult to get accurate and robust data. I would ask, why proceed on unstable ground? So this is what Jo Phoenix had to say um, in her paper. When you don't, it must always be remembered that the risk that's being assessed and managed have in fact created mixed sex prisons blind to the poor state of the evidence base. And she was speaking specifically about Canada but I think it's relevant across all jurisdictions that are seeking to replace sex with gender identity. Why not answer the questions before enacting policies? Many have surmised this is due to the enduring nature of women's invisibility, our objectification and dehumanisation. When our governments and politicians like yesterday profess to care about women, but undermine our rights actively and pervasively, it's difficult to argue this is not the case. Queensland Corrective Services has a case-by-case -case assessment process for individuals who apply to be transferred to the opposite sex prison. A similar policy was adopted in Scotland, you might remember, last year, and arguably contributed to the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon. Scotland pushed through self-ID and waved off all concerns about downstream impacts, including where women in prison were concerned. Barely had the ink dried before it was found that the ridiculous risk was being imposed upon women in prison and the staff in pr female prison estates. Not one, but two males, like it was in a matter of weeks, had been approved or transferred to the female prison estate using that case-by-case -case assessment. One of those males, Tiffany Scott, who has since passed, was approved for transfer to the female prison estate. That was despite Burns slash Scott being held indefinitely in prison due to the assessment that he was an unmanageable risk in the community. That apparently didn't preclude him from this case-by-case -case assessment that he stalked a 13-year-old girl from prison also apparently didn't preclude him from consideration for transfer. That he attacked a nurse, threw a chair at another, and engaged in a series of violent incidents in the male estate also was no apparent reason for concern. Similarly, the case-by-case -case assessment policy in Scotland enabled the transfer of a male double rapist to the to the female prison estate on the basis of self-declared transgender identity, and that is the individual on the right. I guess we should be thankful that we're not like the US and some states like California, which appear to have discarded entirely sex segregation in favour of gender. There have been multiple reports over the past couple of years of violent and sexual victimisation of female prisoners by males who say they are transgender. Such as this report. Women's prisons are very different to male prisons and it's widely recognised that there are very good reasons for that. Due to the reduced risk of violence, the overwhelming burden of trauma many incarcerated women experience and our specific needs. Remember, too, that it was but 200 years ago last year that the introduction of sex segregation in prison was introduced in the UK. Part of the reason that segregation was, of that segregation was due to the risk of sexual violence posed by housing female prisoners with males. It is a sad indictment 
upon the consideration of women's human rights and their needs in all jurisdictions that have enabled the primacy of gender identity over sex without firstly closing the knowledge gaps or even really attempting to. Um, and I'll say to Anna this morning, I don't feel like that's very positive. But I've thought of something. She said, yes, that's positive. So I am positive it is unreasonable to house males in female prisons. Woo!